best book of the Bible, Revelation, chapter 19. Immediately somebody cringes, says, Revelation, oh dear Lord, isn't that the scariest book in the Bible? Not really. Not when you see what I'm about to share with you. Revelation chapter 19. I want you to begin with me, if you would, at verse 5 through verse 10. If I'm not reading a lot of scripture today, just five verses. And if you'll stand when you found the text in honor of the reading of God's word. Revelation chapter 19, verses 5 through 10. And I'm going to read from the New King James Version for clarity of understanding. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. The testimony of who? Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I know you, you can't even begin to know how much TNT there is in those five verses we just read. <laughs> but we're going to get right into it, okay? Would you bow with me? Lord, we thank you once again for this opportunity to be in your house. God, you placed a word upon my heart today for this people. For those that might hear this message by tape, God, I need your anointing, I need your presence, I need your power like I've never needed it before. Lord, this hour, unleash your spirit in this place, that every heart that hears your word might be touched, that they might be moved upon to believe and obey this wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh God, today, let this word go forth with power, that it might convert the unbeliever from their way. Lord, that it might bring healing to the body of the sick, that it might bring deliverance to the spirit of that which is bound. Master, in the name of Jesus, we ask all this. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated. Praise God. Amen. Tell the king I accept his invitation. That's the title of my message today. Now, you remember that old song we used to sing in the Church of God? Tell the king I accept his invitation To the feast he has gone to prepare I'll sit down at his table With the thanks of the Lord At the great marriage supper up there we used to sing that in Billy Gillen's church, and boy, the Holy Ghost to get to moving in the church. It's not a fast song. It's not a drum beating song. But you know what? It's not the drum beat that makes the people of God happy. It's the truth that's in the message of the song. Tell the king, I accept his invitation. Hallelujah. He invited me to be part of the marriage supper of the Lamb. He invited me to be part of the bride of Christ. And you just tell it for me. I accept. Hallelujah. When the time comes, yes, I'm going to be there. Hallelujah. I remember Sister Bruce and I, I went up to, to uh, Shamrock, Texas, 
to preach for Sister Bruce. She was a lady friend of mine, a Church of God minister. And uh, she and her husband pastored a beautiful little church up in Shamrock, about 120, 130 people, good-sized church. And she said, uh, Chuck, I want us to sing together. I love when we sing together. See, I used to be able to sing. Before I had that pneumonia and they shoved those tubes down my throat, I really could sing. I really could. But it somehow didn't do my voice real good when they did all that. I haven't been able to sing too good ever since. That's why I keep, you know, hitting those Whoa! notes that go way off in the boonie somewhere, you know. She said, I want us to sing. And I said, okay, what shall we sing? She said, let's sing. Yes, I'm going to be there. I said, oh, dear Jesus, we'll be lucky if we don't fly out of the building. Now, Sister Bruce is not a little woman. She's a big lady, big lady. In case she hurt this tape. She's sitting behind that piano, and in her church, their church was a little bit, maybe a little bit smaller than this one, you know, a little bit narrower and what have you. She's sitting behind the piano, well, there's not too much room between the piano bench and the wall at all. There's maybe a few inches, you know. There's this big lady sitting at that piano, and we get to singing, yes, I'm going to be there. When they crown him king, I'm going to be, yes, I'm going to be there. When that choir begins to sing, I want to celebrate how I am to paint the crowning of Christ as king of kings. But Sister Bruce, you always know when she's going to get happy. She gets loud. Now, you, now, everybody knows when I get excited, I get loud. But Sister Bruce, when she gets happy, the Holy Ghost starts touching her. All of a sudden, she starts getting louder and louder till you think that she is some sort of a warming device to let people know there's a hurricane a coming, okay? So we're sitting there singing, and the first round, you yes, I'm going to be there. Well, when they crown the king, I'm going to be, yes, I'm going to be there. When that choir begins to sing, I want to celebrate how I anticipate the crowning of Christ as King of Kings. Next time around, yes, I'm going to be there when they crown in King. Third time around, yes, I'm going to be there when they crown in King. Well, the fourth time around, forget it. I can't imitate that. You bring down airplanes. Well, I'm telling you, we get to singing that song. We're singing about the happiest day in all of eternity for every believer. <laughs> the day that Jesus Christ is crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords when He assumes the throne to be the God of His people and His people assume their rightful place as His bride. And this marriage is consummated. And a celebration ensues. That's what we're reading about in our text this afternoon. And that's the greatest day, Emily. You'll be able to look over at Grandpa and see the smile on his face as he's rejoicing in the same event that you're rejoicing in. Because it's the same event that he was looking forward to 50 years ago when he first prayed through I'll be able to look over her great grandma and see her just filled with joy because her whole life she waited to see Jesus crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All her life she waited to be part of the marriage supper of the Lamb. But my friend will not be there as invited guests. We're going to be there as part of the host. Hallelujah. We're going to be there as the bride. Praise God. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. <laughs> well, I'll have you to know, Sister Bruce, she got to screaming that song to where I couldn't hardly hear the words. <laughs> but the dogs couldn't. Spirit of the Lord hit me. I tore off behind that piano. I come running. They didn't have one of these altar rails like we've got here. I come running off that platform. It was up about 
a good 16 inches high. I come leaping off that platform, begin to run around the church. It was like somebody set my pants on fire. I just couldn't help myself. It was, it was just so wonderful. Everything I was feeling was so wonderful that I just couldn't understand it. And I ran around that church about four or five times. And after the service, one of the ladies said, we had a woman down here praying for the Holy Ghost in the altar. She said, for some reason, she just couldn't seem to get through. She said, all of a sudden, you run by. She said, the wind that was following you blew her hair out of her face, and she began to speak in tongues and magnify God. Because the power of God was so powerfully present. You know why? Because the message of the rapture of the church of the catching away of the bride of Christ is a true message. <laughs> and those who have not been raised in churches where you've heard it taught and you've understand this truth, I'm going to tell you, you're missing something wonderful because it's one of the greatest things that you could ever know in your entire spiritual existence. There is coming a day when all of God's people living and dead are going home. Hallelujah. There is coming a day when all of God's people living and dead are going to be reunited in, a, in, in order for the marriage of the Lamb with His bride to be consummated. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. The Apostle Paul wrote, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it, that He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word, that He might present it to himself. Did you hear me? That he might present it to himself. A glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. You see, the son or the second person didn't come down and, and redeem the church so he could present it to somebody else. Amen. God became the son and bought himself a church on the cross of Calvary so that he could present it unto himself, a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Listen to what Jesus said. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Tommy, I don't care what some organizations teach. He said, I will come again and receive you unto myself. He didn't say he was going to come down here and set up camp with us. He said he was going to get us and have us set up camp with him. Hello now. That's what he said. He said, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. Hallelujah. Now that's a rock solid promise. The Lord Jesus Christ just got through saying, listen folks, if you fear God, if you love God, then just, if, if you can do that, then just put some confidence in me, just trust me. You know why? Because in the long run you're going to find out we're one and the same, that's why. But just for now, just trust me a little bit here on this one, okay? I know it's hard looking at a man and thinking of him as anything more than a man, but just trust me a little. Because let me tell you, in my Father's house are many mansions. Now, how many people that lived in the Lord's day looked at him and said, well, he's full of baloney. I've been to Joseph's house. Oh, but Joseph wasn't my father. <laughs> in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. What, was he, what did he just say? He, he, I'm going to paraphrase for you real easy. I'm not going to lie to you. That's what he said. If it were not so, I would have told you. He said, I wouldn't tell you a lie. Now, he just got through Emily saying, I'm not going to tell you a lie. And then the next words out of his mouth are, I'm going away, but I'm coming back to get you. 
So honey, if he's promising he ain't going to lie to us, I hope to heaven he must surely have been telling the truth when he said, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. I believe he was telling the truth. Amen. And I'm ready. Praise God. Amen. I'm ready. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 57, the Apostle Paul writes, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. We shall all be changed. You see, there are some people out there in the religious world who are waiting for a Jesus that they don't even know who he really is, but they're waiting for him to come and set up a kingdom on earth and make everything right and make people act right and make people do right and make people live right. But you know what? Paul said, we're not all going to be dead. He said, but we're all going to be changed. He ain't coming to set up a kingdom in this old messed up world. He ain't coming to fix this old messed up world. That's not what it's all about. Then Paul goes on to say, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So he tells us when this change is going to take place. At the resurrection. At the moment of the rapture. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. There is a change coming, Emily, and tell the king I accept his invitation. I'm willing to change. I'm ready to change. Amen. You see, I'm not even trying to cling to this old world the way it is. Come on now. I'm not, I don't even want to know nothing about the way this world is. I'm looking for the change. First Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Paul tells us, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. So again, he's talking about the dead, those who have passed on, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. Hallelujah with them in the clouds. Oh, hallelujah, like the old song says, there is going to be a meeting in the air in that sweet, sweet by and by, hallelujah. I am going to meet you and preach you over there in that home beyond the sky. Such singing we will hear, never heard by more than ear. It will be glorious, I do declare. Hallelujah to God. Oh, there's a rapture. There's a catching away of God's people. You can bank on it. You can bet on it. That's what the apostles taught us. That's what Jesus said. He said, if I come, uh, if I go away, I'll come back and I'll get you. Well, if you're going to get me, then that means obviously you're going to take me from here to wherever you're at. Because he said, that where I am, ye may be also. He didn't say I'm going to come set up camp with y'all. 
Now, if the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Meaning, after that, we will never be separated from the Lord again. From that day forward, we're going to be with Jesus. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. One of the greatest doctrines of the church is the catching away of the bride of Christ for the for the for the the wedding. Uh, I don't want to say ceremony, but for the consummating of the marriage. It's pitiful that there are some in this world who have decided to rewrite the Bible because they're uncomfortable with that doctrine, and they say, "No, that isn't going to happen." Well, it's not going to happen for you, so I guess it don't matter. Amen. And that's not when the moral trying to be mean, but my Bible says that the Lord's only coming for those who, who love His appearing. If you ain't looking for Him to come, then honey, He ain't going to come for you. If you're sitting here thinking He's going to come and set up shop next door to you and, and you know, renovate this old world and uh, have all these little human beings floating around that are doing things right because He's kind of got them under His thumb, uh-uh, it's not going to work that way. I'm going to tell you, in a nutshell, how it's going to work. Where everybody knows anything about the Bible knows that we're headed for a time of what the Scripture refers to as tribulation. The first three and a half years of that tribulation, interesting, think about this a minute. The tribulation is supposed to be a seven-year period of time, divided into two halves, each half being three and a half years. What notable event occurred over the course of three and a half years in human history? Huh? The Lord Jesus Christ's public ministry. If God figured he can say everything he needed to say in three and a half years, then I guess that he figures that humanity in three and a half years can hear everything it needs to hear. The first three and a half years are going to be a time when the Antichrist is getting poised for power. And he's going to be very much on the scene. The church is going to be here. The church is also going to experience a tremendous amount of pressure and a tremendous amount of persecution because of the Antichrist. But that persecution and that pressure is going to serve God's purpose as a sifting. All that can be shaken will be shaken, the Scripture said. It's going to serve as a, sh as a sifting so that the wheat and the chaff are separated, so that the, the goats and the sheep are separated. Why? Because we're coming up closer to the rapture. Judgment must first begin where? At the house of God. So the first three and a half years of tribulation, even though it's Satan himself inflicting it upon the church, it's serving God's purpose. It's serving his function. He wants to sift the church out so that those who are on the play in church are done and over with, and those who mean business remain. Then the Bible said that the son of perdition is going to walk into the re-established and rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. He is going to walk into the Holy of Holies and in the very place where God himself is represented as, as existing and living. He's going to declare himself to be God, which is called the abomination of all abominations. When this man does this, it's the greatest abomination that could ever be committed. Jesus said, when you see this abomination. He said, honey, if you're on top of the roof, don't even go downstairs. <laughs> he said, 
set of you up on the mountain. Don't even try to walk home because you won't get there. He says, look up because your redemption is at hand. It's right there. At the very moment that Satan has the audacity through the Antichrist to stand in the face of God and to defy him, God says, all right, it's time to get my church out of there because all hell's about to burst loose. And God will not judge the righteous with the wicked, the scriptures tell us. Their judgment has been in the first half. So the righteous are taken. They're taken. The marriage is consummated up in heaven in the marriage supper of the Lamb. And during that three and a half years, God unleashes a judgment on planet Earth that will make some of the sci-fi movies we've seen over the last 20, 30 years look like cotton candy. Water will be turned to blood. A third of the Earth's waters are going to be just, just ruined. Food supplies are going to be miserably short. It's going to be a horrible time. But the Antichrist is going to present himself as the answer to all of this. Because why? Because he is literally in a combat against God. But there still are a people on Earth who represent the Lord God Jehovah. And he doesn't like them too well because of who they represent. So the Jewish nation becomes his target. See, the Jews wouldn't accept Jesus. They didn't know who he was. But you know what? The Antichrist is going to set his sights on the Jewish nation and he and all his cohorts are going to come together and they're going to come to battle with the people of Israel at the valley called Armageddon. And it's going to be a bloody battle until, <laughs> until the bridegroom on a white horse and his bride behind him appear where? In the clouds. And they come to earth with a mighty crushing blow and destroy the Antichrist in the matter of moments. Crushing. That is the beginning of the new world order. That is the beginning of the renovation that God is going to bring about on planet Earth. But folks, don't kid yourself. We have a rapture to look forward to. We have a resurrection to look forward to. Don't get discouraged. If it doesn't happen in my lifetime, that's okay. Paul said the dead aren't going to hinder the living. <laughs> in other words, we're the first ones to go anyway. So if I don't make it to the rapture, well, that's all right. I'll just see you in the rapture. Amen. Emily, Grandpa didn't live to see the rapture, but you know what? You just wave at him as you're going up. Amen. And said he just wave as you're going up. I love, I love the thought of the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven. It's the, it is the greatest celebration that ever has been celebrated, the greatest thing that's ever occurred. But listen now to, and I'm closing right about now, Revelation 21, 1 through 7. Listen to what John writes here. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Before God is going to bring his people back to earth to live and dwell here, he is going to renovate this place. The Bible says that he is going to literally transform it by fire. He said the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. They were gone. And there was no more sea. Guess what? On God's new earth, there will be nothing to divide the people. There are no more seas. See, the reason we have Africa over there and we have 
America over here, and Asia over there, and Europe over there, and all of these continents is because we're separated by oceans and seas, right? But in God's new renovated earth, that will be the case. You'll actually be able to walk from Africa all the way to Detroit if you want to. Of course, now why you'd want to do that, I don't know. John goes on to say, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Emily, you won't have to go through this again. And he that sat upon the throne said, He that sat upon the throne, not they, he that sat upon the throne. They're not the one sitting on the throne. It's not the one God, there's not the one sitting on the throne. He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. Or, it is finished. The same words we heard on the cross of Calvary. He said, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is the first of the water of, uh, of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Now just in case any of you doubt that it was Jesus Christ sitting on that throne, just in case you doubt it was Jesus Christ speaking, then either God's a liar or the separate person of Jesus is a liar, because in Revelation 1 and 8, Jesus Christ declares, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and was and which is to come, the Almighty. Revelation 1.11 states, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. Revelation 21 and 6, and he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Revelation 22, 13. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Anybody who knows anything about Scripture knows it was Jesus speaking in these other references I just read to you. There's no doubt it was the Lord speaking in those references. There's no doubt in Revelation 1 and 8, 1 and 11. Uh, absolutely no doubt that it was Jesus who declared, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So it can either be one way. It can either be that the same God who spoke from the throne and declared himself Alpha and Omega was the same Jesus who purchased this church. Amen. The Bible said God purchased this church with his own blood. Well, God don't have any blood. But he did have blood because he revealed himself to us as a human being, as a man that we call Jesus. Oh, tell the king I accept his invitation. Emily, do you want to tell the king you accept his invitation? Say, you're ready. Say, Lord, I'm ready to go. I'm ready. When he calls, I will answer. Here am I. That's an old song we used to sing. Oh, when he calls me, I will answer. Here am I. Lord, I accept your invitation. I want to be in the marriage supper. I want to be there. 
I got loved ones that are planning on being there, and I just want to make it a, a nice party. <laughs> I want to make, I want to be there with them. Amen. I want to spirit this thing together with them. And you know, Jesus, whether you come in my lifetime or you don't, all these preachers that try to predict the coming of the Lord, what a bunch of foolishness. Who cares? Living or dead, I'm going. Amen. Who cares? Living or dead, I'm going. Everybody's so afraid of death, even in the church, they're so afraid of death. Everybody wants to live to see the rapture. Well, it'd be wonderful to live to see the rapture, I suppose. But you know what? I guess in the final analysis, it ain't going to matter to you one way or the other. Not going to really make a whole lot of difference. But I just wanted to say today, tell the king I accept his invitation. And I want to invite you today, make certain of your reservation. Make certain of your reservation. Because that same story I just read to you about those who would be part of the bride of Christ and who would celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb. There's a verse that I didn't bother including in my text tonight, but the verse that immediately followed says that the fearful and the unbelieving shall have their part in the lake of fire, which is the second death. Amen. You've got to make up your mind at some point in your life. You've got to, you got to, what the scripture says, to set your face like a flint. Amen. In other words, get it in your head that you know the way, and then, and then stick your shoulder to the wheel and go. You know, you can, you can sit through life and, and expect that, well, hopefully in the, in the long run it'll all work out. Well, hopefully. But we don't know. So the best thing to do is to be prepared. So I'm just sending my message, Lord. I told you when I was about six, maybe. I accept your invitation, but you know what? I'm telling you again. Amen. I accept your invitation, and I'm looking forward to the day. Amen. Would you stand with me? That was a fairly simple message, huh? Once a man made a supper, and as many to come to partake of his graceful and free. But they all made excuses, saying, I cannot come. So he gave the invitation to me. King, I accept his invitation to the feast he has gone to prepare. I'll sit down at his table with the saints of the Lord at the great marriage supper. Master, we just are so grateful today for the hope that we have in you, the promise that we have been given from your own lips, that if you go away, you will come again and receive us unto yourself, that where you are, there we may be also. Lord, as one that is betrothed to a prince or a king, today your church awaits the time when you will come and redeem your people and take us from this place and bring us back to your home. For Lord, you're not the kind of husband that marries a bride and then moves in with her folks. But rather, God, you are fully prepared to bring us to a place which you have specifically, specially prepared for us. And we call that place the New Jerusalem. And one day after this earth has been renovated, God, we understand that this new Jerusalem will descend from heaven and within its walls will be the people of God, will be the saints of God, the bride of Christ. But Lord, will not touch foot on this earth one more time after we've been raptured away until the earth has been renovated by fire 
and all things have been made new. Master, today help us to take this word of exhortation home with us. Lord, help it to encourage our hearts. Help, it, help us, Lord, to make a deeper and greater commitment to serve you and to know you and to love you more. Master, let not one word of this simple message be wasted on a single person that's in this place or anyone that might hear this message by faith. But rather, God, let every word that was spoken find its way to the heart of the hearer. Master, we just ask it today in the wonderful, lovely name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, our Redeemer, our Savior, our King, and our Sovereign. In Jesus' name, Amen. God bless you. I hope you found that encouraging today.